Okay, here we are. We're back. We're talking about some more periodic properties. We talked about atomic radius. Um, we said that as you went across a period, atoms got smaller, at least the radius got smaller. Um, and of course that was due to an increasing effect of nuclear charge. That simply means you're gaining protons without gaining additional energy levels. When you went down a group, atoms got larger, the radius got larger, and of course that was due to uh, gaining energy levels every time you move down an atom on the group. And of course, we talked about the shielding effect. Well, now we're going to talk about, quickly, ionic radius. So we're going to define an ion first. Uh, I'm going to give you a pretty simple definition. I think you actually have the, to define this in your notes or in your homework tonight as well. So an ion is a charged atom or group of atoms. Uh, and that's due to the gain or loss of electrons. So think about this. If you gain electrons, you end up with a negative charge. Right? If you're neutral and someone starts throwing negative electrons on you, you're going to become more and more negative. Now, of course, if there's a loss of electrons, that means you're neutral and somebody's taking negative electrons away from you, you gain a positive charge. So there are positive and negative ions. So my first question is, how can an atom become a positive ion? Is it through gaining or losing electrons? Well, of course, it's due to the loss of electrons. Now, by the way, that could just be an electron or more than one electron. Um, how does the size of a positive ion compare with the atom from which it was made? How do you think the radius changes when you lose an electron? Let's take a look. Let's uh, pick on, I don't know, uh, sodium. So there's the nucleus of a sodium atom. And we know sodium has 11 electrons. So we're going to draw a simple Bohr model. We'll put a pair in the first. It has two electrons in the first energy level. And it has four pairs in the second. Right? So a total of ten so far. So it needs to have a third energy level. And there's one electron there. So this is plain old vanilla sodium. It has eleven protons and eleven electrons. It is neutral. Now let's go ahead and take an electron away. So what would it look like after that? Well, let's see, we still have the nucleus, and that still has 11 protons in it. Well, we'll still have a first energy level with a pair of electrons in it. And we'll still have a second energy level with four pairs in it. All right. So that's a total of 10 electrons, started with 11. We took one away, so now we have 10, and, and we're done. So this would be sodium with a positive one charge. We've taken one electron away, but kept the number of protons the same. I'm just looking at my silly diagram here. You can tell that the sodium ion is smaller than the atom from which it came. So that's always the case. Uh, positive ions are always smaller than the atom from which they came from. Now there are two reasons for that. And there's actually a, more than that, but we're just going to talk about two reasons. Number one, oftentimes when you become a positive ion, there is the loss of an energy level. When an energy level is lost, boy, the next energy level down, of course, is closer to the nucleus. And we saw that clearly happening with sodium. Now another reason is there is not as much shielding, but we're not going to include that. We're just going to simply say, uh, for the second reason, there are more protons than electrons. In the case of sodium, remember, um, the sodium atom had 11 protons and 11 electrons. But the sodium ion now has 11 protons. That hasn't changed, but now it only has 10 electrons. So if we have more positives than negatives, it's going to pull those negatives in more tightly and decrease the radius. So you can take a look at this diagram quickly here. The sodium atom has an atomic radius of 186 picometers, while the sodium ion is only 99 picometers. Now magnesium, it has uh, 12 electrons normally, it loses two, so it becomes a two-positive ion. So uh, it's 
atomic radius is even smaller than the atomic radius of sodium, uh, the sodium ion, as we would expect. Okay, so positive ions are smaller. What about negative ions? Well, let's see. Gaining electrons causes an ion to have a negative charge, so this is due to the gain of electrons, electron or electrons. And so how does the size of a negative ion compare with the atom from which it came? Let's pick on fluorine here. Uh, fluorine has nine electrons, has two in the first energy level, and it has seven in the second. There we go. That's plain old vanilla fluorine. Nine protons and nine electrons. That's a certain radius. Now what if it gains an electron to become the fluoride ion? Well, its nucleus doesn't change, and it still has two electrons in the first energy level, but the second energy level doesn't have seven any longer. If it gained one, it now has eight electrons. So that's the fluoride ion. So what do you expect happens to the radius of the fluoride ion compared to the atom from which it came? Well, the answer is, is that they are larger. And we're only going to give one reason. We cannot say that we gained an energy level. Take a look at my picture. Did it gain an energy level when the fluorine atom added an electron to become the fluoride ion? Let's see, start with two, and with two. Nope, didn't gain an energy level. So this time, the reasoning is going to be that there are more electrons than protons. There's more of an electron to electron repulsion. The fluorine atom has nine protons and nine electrons. The fluoride ion still has nine protons, but now it has ten electrons. So there's greater electron to electron repulsion, and that causes the radius to expand a bit. So negative ions are always larger than the atom from which they came. Okay? All right, next up is predicting charges. And uh, we know that um, some atoms can gain or lose electrons. Some atoms gain more than one. Some atoms lose more than one. So it's our job now to predict what those charges might be. Because if they lose electrons, they could be positive 1, positive 2, or positive 3, etc. And if they gain, they could be negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. So, uh, we just did sodium a moment ago. Didn't we say that the sodium ion has a positive 1 charge? Hmm. Well, why? Well, we know that it starts with 11 electrons. Let's take a look at our periodic table. Sodium atom has 11 electrons, and that's not stable. Always ask yourself, is that atom stable? Nope, 11 isn't. I want to have a noble gas configuration. Don't they want to have the same number of electrons as a noble gas? And the noble gas closest to sodium is neon with 10 electrons. So it starts with 11, and it needs to react so it can only have 10. It means it's going to lose one and have a positive charge, right? So it has a positive one charge due to the loss of one electron. Now, is there any other charge that sodium could have? Let's take a look. I suppose with 11 electrons not being stable, it could have a configuration like argon and get up to 18, but it's highly unlikely that an atom is going to gain seven electrons. So we're going to go with no. <laughs> it will not have any other charge. Let's look at this a bit more closely. The electron configuration for sodium, as you should know, is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s1. So, how many electrons do we have to gain, or do we have to lose, to obtain a noble gas configuration? Well, if we can get rid of that one right there, and not have that present any longer, it would have a noble gas configuration, wouldn't it? So the answer is one electron must be lost in this case. And so that's why its charge is positive 1. Let's take a look at magnesium. Magnesium has 12 electrons. Ask yourselves, is that a stable configuration for magnesium? Well, it's not. It's not a noble gas configuration. Neon has 10. So would you expect magnesium to form a 1 positive ion? Nope, you would not. Right? Why not? Well, because it needs to lose two electrons to have 
a noble gas configuration. So it's, most, it's not going to be positive 1. The only charge you'd expect it to have if it loses 2 would be positive 2. Now, try to answer this question without my help. Looking at your periodic table, would nitrogen tend to form a positive or negative ion? Maybe pause this, pull out your periodic table and look at it for a moment, and answer that question, and then answer the question after that. Okay? All right. Welcome back. Let's see how you did. Nitrogen has seven electrons. Ask yourselves, is it stable? Well, it doesn't have a noble gas configuration. It could have a noble gas configuration like neon with 10, or a noble gas configuration like helium with only 2. What's more likely to happen? Will it gain 3 or lose 5? Yeah, if you said it would gain 3, you are correct. So, it would form a negative ion because it's gaining negative charges, and we would expect it to be negative 3. Now, let's make some general observations here. Group 1 of the periodic table, these are all one away, well, except with the case of hydrogen, but they're all one away from having a noble gas configuration. So what charge do you think ions made from group 1 elements would always have? If you said positive 1, you are correct. So to remind myself of that on my periodic table, I put a little positive 1 on top of group 1, just to remind me that when these folks react, they tend to lose one electron and form a positive one ion. What about group number two? I'm going to change that from the Roman numeral two to the Arabic numeral two. What charge would they have? Well, beryllium has four. We'd like to get to two like helium. Magnesium, we just said, has 12. It would like to get to 10 like neon, and so on. They all need to lose two. So if you said plus two, you are correct. So on my periodic table, I like to write plus two on the top of group 2 to remind me that when these folks react, they tend to form two positive ions. Now we're going to get away from the Roman numeral way of numbering. That, shouldn't, that should not say Roman numeral 7. It should say group 17. Okay, and the one beneath that should not say six, Roman numeral 6. It should say group 16. So please make that change in your notes for me. If we scooch all the way over to group 17, that's the halogen family. Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and astatine, and you can see they all need to gain one to become like a noble gas. So if you said negative one for the charge of group 17, you would be correct. What about group 16? It's the oxygen family. They're two away from becoming like a noble gas. So if you said negative two, you are right again and you're on a roll. So I'm going to put negative one above the halogen family to remind me that these are negative one when they form ions, and negative 2 above the oxygen family, because they tend to be negative 2 when they form ions. Now the non-metals in the nitrogen family tend to be negative 3. I'm going to put a negative 3 up there. And above the noble gases, I'm going to put a 0 to remind me that they don't gain or lose electrons. Okay. Now, the transition elements are a bit interesting. They are these guys right in the middle. We have a small problem when we run into the transition metals. Let me give you an example. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you what you should know about transition elements. It turns out that they can have more than one positive charge. So many of them, I should say, can have more than one positive charge. And let me show you why. Let's pick on iron. Now, iron has 26 electrons. All right. So if I were to write the electron configuration for iron, I would start with 1s2, then 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d. Let's see how far that is into the d. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we would end with 3d6. How many electrons would iron have to gain or lose to have a noble gas configuration? Ooh, geez, Louise, let's see. It has 26. It could gain a bunch. Um, it could gain 10 to become like krypton, which has 36. Or if it has 26, it could lose 8 and become like argon, which has 18. So it could gain 10, or it could lose 8. 
so are either of those likely to happen? Do you think um, the energy required to take away 10 electrons would be minimal? No, it would be very difficult to take away 10 electrons from iron. That's not likely to happen. And on the opposite side, it's difficult for a nucleus to attract uh, very many more electrons than it already has, especially as the radius increases. So this is definitely not likely to happen. So, how do we figure out the charge for iron if it's not going to gain 10 or lose 8? What are we going to do? Well, I'm going to make you wait for the next video to find out. If you want to look at it on your own, go ahead. You can do that. So we'll stop for right now. Put this up, and we'll continue with iron next time. See you then. Bye-bye.